In the crushing blackness of the North Atlantic, 400 feet beneath the surface, the concept of war changes from a chaotic exchange of fire to a silent, heart-stopping chess game where the only winning move is never to be seen at all. This is the domain of the Columbia, the United States Navy's newest and most lethal phantom, a vessel designed not to fight battles but to end civilizations, or more importantly, to ensure that no one dares to start the end. As the hull groans almost imperceptibly under the pressure, the sheer magnitude of this engineering marvel becomes clear. It is the largest submarine ever constructed by the United States, a 560-foot leviathan displacing over 20,000 tons, yet it glides through the water with the acoustic signature of a whisper. That Columbia is not merely a replacement for the aging Ohio class, it is a generational leap, a machine built for a singular, terrifying purpose, strategic deterrence in an era where the oceans have become transparent and the enemies have become smarter. The dramatic tension on board a Columbia class submarine is unlike anything in the conventional military world, because the crew lives in a perpetual state of almost are almost at war every single day. The primary weapon of this beast is the Trident 2D5 LE ballistic missile, and the Columbia carries 16 of them in its missile tubes, for fewer than its predecessor, but with vastly improved survivability and targeting. Each missile is a harbinger of the apocalypse, capable of carrying multiple independent nuclear warheads to targets thousands of miles away with pinpoint accuracy. But the true battle for the Columbia is not launching these weapons. It is the silent, sweating struggle to keep them hidden. Imagine a scenario in the Barents Sea, a traditional bastion for Russian naval power, where a Columbia-class boat, the USS District of Columbia, is on its maiden deterrent patrol. The water here is cold, dense, and filled with the acoustic clutter of shifting ice, the perfect hiding spot, but also a deadly trap dot in this hypothetical engagement. The enemy is a Russian Yasin M class attack submarine, a hunter killer designed specifically to locate and destroy American boomers before they can launch their payload. The Columbia's captain, standing in the expanded command center, watches a waterfall display of sonar data that is being fed not just by the ship's own sensors, but by a complex algorithm of AI-enhanced acoustics. This is the first major difference in the next generation war. The boat listens better than anything that has come before. The Yasinem is quiet, but the Columbia is a ghost. The secret lies in the Columbia's revolutionary electric drive propulsion system. Unlike the reduction gears of the Ohio class, which required massive, heavy machinery to transfer power from the steam turbines to the propeller machinery that vibrated and hummed with a distinct frequency, the Columbia uses an electric motor to turn its pump jet. Pro this decouples the reactor from the hull in a way that eliminates the telltale mechanical whine that sonar operators have hunted for decades. In our scenario, the Russian hunter passes within 5,000 yards a suicidal distance in the old days, but the Columbia remains invisible, a hole in the water. Its X-shaped stern controls surfaces, adjusting its depth with the grace of a living creature rather than a steel tube. The drama of the Columbia class is also found in the sheer industrial stakes of its existence. There is no plan B for the United States sea-based nuclear deterrent. The Ohio-class submarines are reaching the end of their service lives, their hulls fatigued by decades of pressure cycles, their reactors nearing exhaustion. The Columbia program has been described as the most critical acquisition program in the Navy, a title that carries with it immense political and logistical weight. If the Columbia fails, or if it is delayed significantly, the credibility of the nuclear triad crumbles. This puts a different kind of pressure on the shipbuilders at Electric Boat and Newport News Shipbuilding. Every weld must be perfect. Every inch of the specialized anechoic coating, the rubber-like tiles that absorb enemy sonar pings must be flawless. The script of the Columbia's life began long before it touched the water. In the heated boardrooms of the Pentagon and the steel mills of the industrial base, where the battle was fought against budget cuts, supply chain fractures, and the relentless march of time, let us return to the operational theater where the tension escalates. The Columbia is designed to remain on patrol for 80-yard days at a stretch, disappearing into the vastness of the Pacific or the Atlantic. The crew of 155 sailors operates in a world of artificial light and recycled air. On the Columbia, the quality of life has been improved to sustain the mental focus required for such isolation. There are more screens, better connectivity for internal systems, and improved berthing, but the psychological weight remains. In a simulated war game conducted by naval strategists, a Columbia-class submarine is tasked with a flush scenario. Intelligence suggests a surprise attack is imminent. The order comes to flush the fleet to get every available SSBN out of port and into the deep ocean immediately. This is 
is where the Columbia's superior readiness shines. Its nuclear reactor is designed to last the life of the ship 42 years without ever needing to be refueled. This means the boat spends less time in dry dock and more time at sea. In the chaos of the simulated crisis, the Columbia slips its moorings and vanishes into the continental shelf break, its speed increasing to over 20 knots. The electric drive provides instant torque, allowing the massive vessel to maneuver with the agility of a much smaller attack submarine, evading the blockade of enemy drones and satellites trying to track its heat wake. The battles of the future will not be fought solely with torpedoes, but with information, and the Columbia is a data fortress. It is equipped with the large Aperture Bolab Array, a sonar system that wraps around the front of the submarine, providing a 360-degree view of the acoustic environment without the blind spots that plagued earlier generations. In our dramatic narrative, the USS District of Columbia detects a swarm of unmanned underwater vehicles, UUVs, deployed by a rival nation. These drones are the new terrors of the deep, small, autonomous, and swarming, looking for the magnetic anomaly of a massive steel hull. The Columbia's captain engages the ship's silent running protocol to an extreme degree. The ship slows to a crawl, the flow of water over the hull becoming laminar and smooth. The crew stops all unnecessary movement. In the mess hall, silverware is placed on rubber mats. In the engine room, the monitoring is entirely passive. The UUVs buzz past, their sensors searching for a frequency that simply isn't there. The Columbia is not just quiet. It is acoustically darker than the background noise of the ocean itself. But what happens if the deterrent fails? What if the order that no one wants to hear actually comes through the encrypted, very low frequency VLF radio trailed miles behind the boat? This is the climax of the script, the moment the Columbia was built for, but hopes never to execute. The procedure is a terrifyingly choreographed dance of human verification and mechanical precision. The captain and the executive officer must agree on the validity of the launch order, matching codes from the president with those in the ship's safe. On the Columbia, this process is streamlined by digital controls, but the gravity is human. The ship rises to launch depth, hovering just below the surface disturbances. The common missile compartment, a joint design with the British Royal Navy's dreadnought class, floods the tubes. The silence of the submarine is broken by the violent ejection of the missile by expanding gas, pushing the 50-ton cylinder through the water and into the air before the rocket motor ignites. In this nightmare scenario, the Columbia reveals its position to the world, transforming from a ghost into a dragon. The launch of a single Trident missile is a spectacle of physics and terror, but the Columbia can ripple fire its entire payload in minutes, delivering a strike that could alter the geography of the planet. However, the true genius of the Columbia class lies in ensuring that this moment remains a simulation. The battle is the patrol itself. It is the boredom, the drill, the maintenance of the complex systems. It is the battle against the ocean's corrosion and the battle against complacency. The Columbia features a fly-by-wire ship control system, replacing the hydraulic levers of the past with digital interfaces that allow the pilot to hold depth within inches, even in rough seas. This stability is crucial for missile launch accuracy, but it also reduces the fatigue of the helmsman, who sits in a chair that looks more like a cockpit than a bridge. The interface is intuitive, displaying the ship's attitude and the surrounding terrain in high definition. Graphical representations derived from sonar returns. This allows the Columbia to hug the seafloor, hiding in the canyons and trenches of the Atlantic Ridge. Using the geology of the Earth as a shield against active sonar pings from surface destroyers, we must also consider the battle of construction and the timeline. The Columbia class is being built in modules, massive sections of hull that are outfitted with piping and electrical cabling before being welded together. This method, perfected on the Virginia class, is being pushed to its limits here. The quad-pack missile tubes are a prime example of this modular efficiency. Instead of building the missile compartment as one empty silo and filling it later, the tubes are built in packs of four and inserted into the hull sections. This innovation was meant to save time, but it also introduced early production defects that threatened to derail the program. The drama of the Columbia is not just in the water. It is in the welding bays where a microscopic crack can delay the deployment of the nation's most important asset. The workers building these ships are fighting a war of precision, knowing that a single mistake could cost the lives of 155 sailors ten years down the line. The strategic landscape the Columbia enters is vastly different from the one the Ohio class was born into. The Arctic is melting, opening new transit routes and new battlegrounds. The Columbia is designed with ice-hardened sail and diving planes that have been moved from the sail to the hull, allowing it to break through thick polar ice to launch its missiles.
missiles. This capability turns the entire Arctic Ocean into a bastion for the U.S. Navy. In a theoretical conflict in 2035, the Columbia could be lurking under the ice cap, invisible to satellites and immune to surface ships. An enemy attempting to hunt, it would have to enter the ice zone, a dangerous and noisy endeavor that would immediately tip off the Columbia's superior sensors. The submarine becomes a predator in the ice, listening to the cracking and shifting of the flows, distinguishing the sound of nature from the sound of an approaching enemy torpedo. The narrative of the Columbia also involves its relationship with the Virginia-class attack submarines. While the Virginia is the sword, the Columbia is the shield. In a full-scale naval war, Virginia-class boats might be sacrificed to protect the Columbia. The battle here is one of escort and distraction. U.S. naval doctrine suggests that while SSBNs operate alone to maintain stealth, the ocean around them is sanitized by attack subs. If a Columbia-class boat is detected, the priority of every other asset in the theater shifts to protecting it. The drama escalates as we imagine a Columbia being trailed by a new Chinese-type 096 submarine. The Columbia cannot fight back with torpedoes without revealing its position and failing its primary mission of remaining hidden. It must rely on evasion. The captain orders a deep dive, pushing the hull to its test depth, the steel compressing, the bulkheads groaning. The electric drive pushes the boat into a thermal layer, a stratum of water with a different temperature that reflects sonar waves, creating a sound shadow. The Columbia slips into this shadow, effectively disappearing from the enemy's screen, leaving the hunter confused and blind. The technology of the Columbia extends to its life support systems, which generates oxygen and scrub carbon dioxide with greater efficiency and less noise than previous systems. This allows the sub to stay submerged for as long as the food lasts. In our script, we can imagine a scenario where a global crisis forces the Columbia to extend its patrol beyond the standard 90 days. The crew, cut off from all news, relies on the calm voice of the captain and the steady hum of the ship. The psychological strain is the enemy here. The battle is internal. The Columbia provides a gym, a library, and better food to combat this. But the reality of being a cog in the nuclear machine is a heavy burden. The script highlights the professionalism of the blue and gold crews, the two alternating teams that man the boat, ensuring it is always at sea. When one crew brings the boat in, the other is waiting on the pier, ready to take it back out within days. This operational tempo is grueling, a relentless cycle that has no end as long as nuclear weapons exist. Let's zoom in on the weapons. Control center of the Columbia during a high-stress drill. The fire control system is a modernized version of the one used on the Ohio boot, with open architecture that allows for rapid software updates. In the past, upgrading a submarine's brain required cutting a hole in the hull to replace mainframe computers. On the Columbia, it is a matter of swapping out servers and updating code. This digital agility is a weapon in itself. In a battle scenario involving cyber warfare, the Columbia is designed to be air-gapped and resilient. If an enemy attempts to jam communication frequencies or hack into the naval network, the Columbia can operate autonomously. Its onboard computers capable of calculating launch solutions using celestial navigation and inertial guidance. Independent of GPS, the script envisions a moment where the GPS constellation is taken offline by anti-satellite missiles. The Columbia, deep underwater, uses a gravimeter to sense the gravitational pull of the seafloor terrain, navigating with blind precision through the underwater valleys, unaffected by the chaos in space. The battles using the Columbia class are also diplomatic. The mere presence of such a capable platform changes the calculus of adversaries. When the USS District of Columbia performs a port visitor rare event for an SSB UNOR surfaces visibly near a contested region, it sends a message louder than any detonation. It is a battle of posturing. The script captures the moment the massive black hole breaks the surface in the North Sea, flanked by Allied destroyers. The water cascades off the missile deck. The American flag is raised on the sail, and the world takes notice. It is a reminder that the United States possesses the ultimate trump card. This psychological warfare is the Columbia's daily trade. It forces potential aggressors to ask, do we know where the Columbia is? If the answer is no, then they cannot risk a first strike. As we near the end of this narrative script, we must acknowledge the battle of legacy. The Columbia carries the torch from the 41 for freedom, the original ballistic missile submarines, and the Ohio class that won the Cold War. The sailors on board walk the same decks, figuratively, as those who stared down the Soviet Union during the Cuban Missile Crisis. But the Columbia is a creature of the 21st century. It is designed for a world of hypersonics and AI. Its hull is coated in advanced polymers. Its propeller is a marvel of fluid dynamics. Its reactor is a masterpiece of nuclear physics. The script
script closes with the image of the Columbia returning to base at Kings Bay, Georgia, or Bangor, Washington. The tugboats guide the Leviathan into the explosive handling wharf. The crew, pale and tired, lines the deck. They have fought no battles, fired no missiles, and sunk no ships. And because of that, they have won the only victory that matters. The Columbia-class SSBN stands as a paradox, the most powerful weapon ever built, designed solely to ensure it is never used. Its battles are fought in the silence of the deep, in the simulations of the strategists, and in the minds of the men and women who serve aboard. It is the silent guardian, the dark watcher, the next generation of peace through strength. As the sun sets over the submarine base, the Columbia sits low in the water, a dark silhouette against the dying light, ready to slip away again, into the black, to fight the war of invisibility, the war of deterrence, the war that keeps the world from burning. The script fades to black, leaving only the sound of the ocean, the domain where the Columbia reigns supreme, unseen and undefeated.